Starting with our first Masterclass live webinar on Thursday, March 14th, international angler and lock carb expert Mike Keady will be explaining early season buzzer tactics. What's the setup? What flies to use? And how to maximize your catch rates? All of this and more, Mike Keady will be explaining. Plus, he will then be answering your questions live during the webinar. And if that's not enough, every attendee will get a copy of Mike's detailed notes and have exclusive access to the recording of the webinar afterwards. And for all of this, tickets to the webinar are just €10. Euros. To attend, you must register and pay in advance by going to irelandonthefly.com forward slash masterclass. Some of you may recall the devastating fish kill that occurred last May on the Bally McRaven River in Ennistime in County Clare. It is estimated there were in excess of 2,000 fish killed in this incident. This has culminated on February the 16th last in a case taken by the IFI for Ishka Aaron admitted liability for this and indeed were fined a total of over 15,000 euros. I got to talk to Jane Gilleran who is an environmental fishery officer with the IFI and represented them in this case. I first asked Jane to tell us a little bit about the Bally McRaven River. It's a tributary, so uh, a river that joins into the Aina, which would be the, like the bigger system there that people would be familiar with if they know Ennis Diamond, they'd know the falls there in Ennis, in Ennis Diamond, just below the bridge to Lynch. So that's the Aina. And then the Bally McRaven joins it just down below the Falls Hotel. So some people might have done, there's a nice little river walk that the local community have kind of developed along the river there. So I think a lot of people locally would be familiar with it because they probably have walked down there or they might have stayed in the Falls Hotel and have seen it. Um, It's a lovely little kind of gorge river. So it runs through, it's kind of steep um, and it comes down from Lickeen Lock. So Lickeen is the lake at the top of the system and that's where the water basically originates from for the Bally McRaven. Yeah, I actually do know it. It's actually beautiful around there. And I do know Lickeen Lock. I remember looking it up and uh, um, I think there are fish in Lickeen Lock as well. Yeah, there's trout. Yeah, trout in it. yeah. We it's it's one of the sites for our say water framework directed monitoring. So and and we do kind of as part of our research program on the salmon, we do these surveys occasionally, um, <clears throat> looking for kind of numbers of juvenile salmon. So uh, the Bally McRaven or the Ina system would be one of those. So yeah, you can see um, there's no salmon above it, but there are trout up there. Right. Okay. So. Uh, Jane, could you just tell us what actually happened with the incident? Well, firstly, we, we got a call actually from a member of the public to one of our local staff. Uh, we have staff who work out of an office in Carfin. So they got a photograph uh, of the river, like being a very kind of browny orange color. Um, and then when we got on site the next day, yeah, so there had been a release of iron oxide, kind of a ferric sulfate solution from the water treatment plant. Uh on probably May the 2nd. And then that led to a fish kill then kind of about 48 hours later. So the fish, there was probably some fish killed initially and the ferric sulfate or the sludge that would have come from the water treatment plant is quite acidic in nature. So you probably would have some fish killed initially in the initial plume that came out of the water treatment plant. Uh, But most of the fatalities seem to be just a longer, slightly longer term kind of suffocation. Um, So the sludge can deposit on the gills of the fish and kind of coat the gills of the fish, essentially blocking them. Um, And they basically just suffocate. So we could, when we found a lot of dead fish, you could see the trout with their mouths open, you know, and usually that indicates that they are struggling to breathe. So um, that probably, we we, we estimate maybe about 2000 fish were killed. Um, So everything basically below the water treatment plant in terms of fish life was wiped out. But in terms of like trying to put a a definitive number on it, that's probably our best estimate because you would have had like the trout and salmon that would have spawned last winter at that time of year aren't really up out of the gravels yet. Uh, So they could have, you know, suffocated or just been coated in sediment in the gravels and again, no oxygen and and would have died there. So counting those is kind of (laughs) kind of impossible. But yeah, we had rudd, we had trout, we had salmon and we had eels. Uh, oh, yeah. Killed significant numbers of of all of those. Ferrox oxide, you call it. Is that a, a byproduct? Ferric, of- ferric sulfate. So it's Fer- it's what it's it's a chemical that they use, uh, and you know all water treatment plants use mm. some type of chemical, and it's a coagulant. So when they take raw water, and the raw water comes in from Licking Lake, 
obviously it's it's you know there's sediment in it there's like humic you know there's 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 sand there's soil particles there might be leaves there's all these kind of things so it's part of just the normal treatment process and um, that these chemicals are used and basically they make the sediment and the impurities kind of stick together right. uh, and make them heavier and then when it goes into a settlement tank it can kind of settle to the bottom of the tank and then you have a kind of cleaner water up above and then that goes forward to the next step of treatment um, where it's just filtered before it ends up in your tap. So basically what this does, it, it, it helps in making the sludge. Is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the sludge comes from. So the sludge then in a water treatment plant is ferric sulfate and then it's all the soil and leaves or whatever other sediment or impurities that were in the water all mixed together essentially and have settled on the bottom of a settlement tank. And is this how most water treatment plants would operate? Yep. Yeah, yeah, this would be kind of standard. Now, they might not all use ferric sulfate. Some might use aluminium sulfate, uh, different, just different kind of types of chemicals to perform the coagulant function. But essentially, yeah, they all work the same way. And then what what's done, because I was interested myself, I was just wondering, what happens to the sludge then afterwards? Is it spread on land or what is it? Is, well, the sludge in Ballymacraven uh, is tankered away and it's brought into other plants with bigger capacity to treat it. So in the case of Ballymacraven, probably most of it goes into Limerick right. um, and then it's further treated there. And then when it's further treated, what happens to it? Some of it's land spread, but some of it, it can go to incineration, but basically it's usually squeezed. So they try and get as much water out of it. Um, right. But yeah, definitely some, especially some of the wastewater treatment uh, sludges are land spread uh, right. because they do have, you know, they have a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen in them. Um, but this sludge tends to be a bit more acidic. So it can Not be reused sometimes. Yeah. No, so it's probably mixed in with the other sludge and probably treated. And I'd say they just correct the pH of it. And then. So back to the actual incident itself. So IFI officers went to the scene and how long did it take to find out what the cause of the problem was? Oh, well, look, we knew pretty quickly yeah. <laughs> what the cause was. <laughs> but because until the until the proceedings are concluded in the court, it's sub judice, so we can't say. So obviously a lot of people were interested and wanted to know what happened. But mm. because we don't want to prejudice the outcome of any court case, we really say very little until the court case is concluded. Um, and we knew that because I did macroinvertebrate sampling. So I looked at the kind of small bugs as you're all anglers, you know what we're talking about yeah, yeah. Uh, and compared them above the treatment plant to below. So you could clearly see that that when it came to macroinverts, there were less numbers and less diversity of macroinverts below the water treatment plant is above. We carried out electrofishing. So survey where we use electricity basically to kind of stun the fish. Uh, they swim towards our gear and we can take them up, survey them, and then put them back alive in the water. So there was absolutely nothing alive below the water, water treatment plant, right. but a nice population of trout above it. And then mm-hmm. right down at the bottom at the confluence with the Ina, you were starting to see one or two, I think we got a couple of rudd and a couple of trout, but you know, fish will run ahead of a plume of pollution. So they probably ran ahead out into the Ina where it was a bit cleaner. And then as soon as you know the pollution kind of passed through, they would make their way back in. And then you would... Because in May is the time of year that you have eels or the juveniles, the elvers, returning from the sargasso, they're just coming in all the time. So there was a few, you know, there was glass eels already back in the bottom, uh, in the bottom of the Ballymacraven. But, you know, it was clear from looking at that, that, you know, that that the point, the source point of the pollution had been the water treatment plant. Yeah, it's obviously when you say it there is really evident. I noticed in the piece uh, that I read that, um, like, there was a lot of salmon killed. I mean, that would have done untold damage to the salmon population on the river, wouldn't it? Yeah, for the Ballymacraven, yeah, because, you know, look, again, as you, your all your listeners know, salmon really return to their natal river. Um, you will get a certain amount of straying, but we probably lost three different age classes of salmon. So the only salmon that possibly weren't affected were if there were grills or multi-sea winters out at sea that haven't come back yet. Mm. So you're probably going to have now this really depressed return of salmon for three years <laughs> yeah. and then maybe those two age classes that were at sea they'll come back and then another three years you'll have very few salmon in the system again over time maybe with a small bit of straying um maybe salmon that were intended for the ina might start to make their way up the ballymacraven instead but really yeah that they'll be very very slow to recover 
God, yeah. That's it just shows really shows us how fragile an environment it can be for Sam. Yeah, and, and how catastrophic, you know, one event can yeah. be in, in a small system. And and that was something, you know, just another fish that is, you know, less well known, but possibly even in more serious uh, status than the salmon is is the European eel. Mm. Um you know, their populations have crashed even lower than than salmon have crashed. And to see, you know, the numbers of eels that were in a small system like that, we were amazed at, you know, and, and you had elvers and you had everything up to like a 60 centimeter eel. Now, the eels will live, you know, different amounts of time in different systems. In big lakes up the Shannon, they might stay up there for, you know, adult females could stay there for 50, 60 years. In a smaller system like... Mm. Mally McRaven and Licking Lock, there's probably not as much food. They're probably not going to stay in as long, but still that fish could have been 18 years old, 20 years old, you know, and and you had everything up to, to adults like that, 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 that were killed. Um, so that, you know, and, and as well as all the trout <laughs> that yeah. were just wiped out. Yeah. Just, yeah. you know, leaving, yeah, leaving aside the trout, which in itself was tragic. The whole thing is very, it was tragic. And I, indeed any fish kill is tragic. Yeah, well, it's the worst one I've ever seen, but you know, by far. So it, they're never, you is know, it it's never a phone it, it, call you want to get. Yeah, yeah. in my time in fisheries, yeah. that's the worst I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You couldn't say much, subdue, subdue to say and everything, but uh, the case did go to court. And what happened at the court case? Yeah, so it concluded there last Friday week, so the 16th of February. Um, and bef- prior to that, uh, Ishka Aaron had pled guilty to two offences on May 2nd and May 18th. So really the court case was me giving evidence uh, to allow the judge to impose a fine. So that was it. So I I gave evidence and described, you know, the, the nature of the incident, uh, the effects it would have had on the river. And, um, and then the judge kind of asked questions. Uh, and then also, um, you know, Ishka Aaron's barrister was there to, 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 you know, ask some questions as well. But really it, at that stage, once somebody's pled guilty, then it's really just to essentially to outline the case to the judge so he can make a decision on the, the, the level of fine he wants to impose. And I see he actually, he actually gave the, the maximum fine, which is 5,000, but there were two charges, were there? Yeah. So, as well as the offence that that led to the fish kill on the 2nd of May, there was actually a second offence on the 18th of May. So there was another release of uh, sludge or the ferric sulfate sludge to the river on May 18th. And um, yeah, so we got samples as well on that occasion. Um, now, while there wasn't a fish kill, because essentially everything had already died <laughs> previously, <laughs> yeah. it's still a release of polluting matter. You know, and that's mm. what the offence is, you know, yeah. to, to release polluting matter to a river. So uh, we took, essentially, we took two cases against Ishka Air and two separate cases for the two different offences. Um, our legislation, the maximum fine that's allowable under our legislation is €5,000. So the judge imposed a maximum fine of €5,000 for each of those offences. So that's why the fine was at 10000 Yeah, because it was, yeah, there was, there was two separate charges on that. Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking about and mentioned there. I mean, five thousand might seem like a lot of money, but really for something as catastrophic and you use that word catastrophic, some groups could actually factor in that cost maybe for saving on runnings or whatever. I'm just saying I'm not trying to be ultra cynical, but is there not yeah. is there any scope for maybe the fine being increased or you know, well, to not make at it the a, moment, a you know Yeah. It look, it can be frustrating sometimes to see the levels of fines, but those are the fines that our legislation yeah. permits. Yeah. So that's what the judge is allowed to impose. But to say that some places might factor it in, I'm not sure that that will always happen because if you have, you know, if you're, for instance, a construction company maybe, and you suddenly now have a fine for a water pollution offence, that can uh, be detrimental in terms of you going for tenders, especially for government tenders or yeah. things like that. So um, if it's somebody in the farming community, water pollution offences, as well as maybe being subject to a court case by, you know, the local authority or by by us for a water pollution offence, you can also lose percentages of your basic farm payment. And that would include like your basic farm, farm payment plus any additional income, such as like an acre scheme or something. So you could be cynical and imagine that, and look, 
who am I to say maybe somebody would include that as the cost of doing mm. business, but you know, then there is the reputational damage as well um, for an individual or a company to, to have their name in the paper as being a water polluter. So, you know, I don't yeah, know. Actually that's very true. And I hadn't really thought of that as very true because I think as water quality becomes a bigger factor to all of us and we realize how important it is to us. Uh, yeah. Having that, having that um, charge against you, doesn't really uh, look too good for you, particularly if you're mm. a company in the public eye. Yeah. The other thing I was going to say there, we've had um, we've had uh, Mary Curry on before from the EPA, and I remember we've done we've done a couple of um, articles on water pollution. Um, so just want to reiterate as well, like the situation that happened in the Valley McRaven. How do people go about reporting it if they see if they're suspicious of something, if they see dead fish? How do they go about it? Yeah. yeah, and actually, like both of these incidents in the Bally McRaven came to us from members of the public. You know, as as much as we are out and about, there's only you know the there's a limited number of staff in IFI to cover the country, so we really do rely on people. You know, if they see something, phoning into us. So we do have a hotline number, and it's kind of manned twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, and you can leave. You know, you can leave an anonymous complaint or an anonymous tip off if you leave your name and address we will you know come back to you and and it is useful because sometimes maybe there isn't enough information in the complaint and it is useful to have a, a phone number to to ring back you can leave a phone number and not leave a name but that number is 0818347424 so 0818347424 but a lot of people if you're in the angling community, you probably know, maybe you know your local, you know, fishery officer protection yeah. staff that are out in the ground. You might know the environmental officer, but you might also know the head office here, you know, Limerick, McCroom, it could be Chalk Brack and Galway, City West, you know, and yeah. those offices are manned kind of Monday to Friday, nine to five. So you can ring your local office as well. Um, but if it's at the weekend or in the evening, then probably the 24 hour hotline number is the best way to, to pass on any information. No, oh, that's great. Yeah, we'll actually we'll we'll put that number up, uh, yeah. accompanying when we when when this is released. Another thing I want to ask you there. So Ishka Aaron, they admitted uh, culpability and everything, and they said that the um, the plant wasn't uh, it wasn't fit for purpose. Yeah, it's it's dealing with. I mean, in fairness to Ishka Aaron, they've inherited a lot of infrastructure around the country that's aging think, and that's yeah. been subject to underinvestment. You know. Um, this plant's operating, I think, 50, 55 percent above capacity right. now. Yeah. And at the, it is undergoing quite a significant kind of investment at the moment. So they are they have almost completed, I think, say, the drinking water, the filtration side of it. And as soon as that portion is completed, then they're going to just run straight into increasing the sediment uh, storage capacity and the sludge storage capacity. So hopefully. Uh, once all that's completed, you know, this should never happen again at that yeah. particular plant. That particular you know, so plant. that's the good news story at the mm. end of this, that that really this hopefully is is solved now for future. Good. Uh, it's, it's really good to hear. I mean, I know the whole the whole thing was a tragic case, but it's good to see this outcome out of it. And also as well, that maybe for other plants that maybe are aging and uh, going beyond capacity, that this would hopefully speed up work that's going to get done on them to bring them yeah up to, yeah up to speed. hopefully hopefully but i guess look there's only so much money to go around and i guess mm. ishka Aaron are probably operating on it you know that they, they have to prioritize where they're spending their money so you know this thankfully has been completed but there are other plants around the country that do need investment um and hopefully that will start to filter through now yeah hopefully hopefully so listen jane that that's absolutely fantastic, and, and I'd like to say uh, fair play to you for the work you did on this. Uh, it's fantastic, and as I said, I know that the case was tragic, but uh, really was, and as you say, catastrophic. But um, it's good to see an outcome coming out of it where you know, should we say, the people at fault uh, were found guilty and fined, and um, you know, hopefully this would go around to everybody else around the country that you you know you won't get away with water pollution. Hopefully, you know, and, and that's really the thing is if people see something, if they're worried about something or they have any suspicions or or knowledge of a pollution source to try and, and speak to us uh, or your local authority, you know, but try and let somebody in charge know. And we will do our best to investigate and try and bring whoever is responsible to, you know, to justice. Jane, thank you very much. 
Thanks very much, Tom. Our thanks to Jane Gilleran for joining us on the show. Don't forget to rate, review and follow the Ireland on the Fly podcast on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Plus, you can keep up to date on IrelandOnTheFly.com as well as on Instagram. And myself and Tom will be back with another episode about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. Starting with our first Masterclass live webinar on Thursday, March 14th, international angler and lock carb expert Mike Keady will be explaining early season buzzer tactics. What's the setup? What flies to use? And how to maximize your catch rates? All of this and more, Mike Keady will be explaining. Plus, he will then be answering your questions live during the webinar. And if that's not enough, every attendee will get a copy of Mike's detailed notes and have exclusive access to the recording of the webinar afterwards. And for all of this, tickets to the webinar are just €10. To attend, you must register and pay in advance by going to irelandonthefly.com forward slash masterclass.